Hey guys, this is Yom Joshi with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. Today we will be talking about Danimer Scientific. Danimer Scientific is a biopolymer manufacturer and David Einhorn, a famous value investor, bought the security back in December of 2020. Through 2021, he bought more of the stock. So in this video, we will look at the company's annual report to better understand this business and then try to figure out why David Einhorn may have purchased the security. So let's dive in and review Danimer Scientific. Hey guys, let's start off by looking at the Form 10K, which is the annual report that Danimer Scientific Inc. filed with the SEC. On page 3 of this report, the company talks about how it came into existence. That is, it came into existence through a special purpose acquisition company, also known as a SPAC, which are formed for the purpose of effecting a merger, capital stock exchange, asset acquisition, stock purchase, recapitalization, reorganization, or similar business combinations with one or more businesses. Live Oak Acquisition Corporation was the SPAC that brought Danimer public. Next, looking at the business overview, Danimer is a performance polymer company specializing in developing and producing bioplastic replacements for traditional petrochemical-based plastics. Danimer brings together innovative technologies to deliver renewable, environmental-friendly bioplastic materials to global consumer product companies. The company has four competencies in fermentation, process engineering, chemical engineering, and polymer science. Danimer believes that it is the only commercial company in the bioplastics market to combine the production of base polymer along with reactive extrusion capacity in order to give customers a drop in replacement for a wide variety of petrochemical based plastics. Its process uses sustainably sourced canola oil. Its proprietary extraction and extrusion processes are cost competitive and leave almost no carbon footprint. The company claims that its scalable production capacity and modular manufacturing model will soon enable it to serve an increasingly large customer base. Finally, the company states that an industry leader as gauged by over 16-year history, a patent portfolio of over 150 patents and pending patent applications worldwide, supply agreements with some of the largest consumer packaged goods companies and numerous awards, including Plastics Industry Association's 2020 Innovation in Bioplastics Award. Danimer is one of the few companies anywhere in the world to achieve this level of sustainability in biopolymer products and processes. Now that the company has painted a rosy picture, it's time for us to come back on the ground by looking at the company's risk factors, which are outlined on page 8 of this report. The company states that it has a history of net losses and its future profitability is uncertain. In other words, the company has never reported a profit. Next, changes in valuation of its private warrants could cause material non-cash losses. Warrants are just like options, except you purchase the warrants directly from the company and they have a longer time duration, so it gives the investor a longer time frame to work out their investment thesis. Next, its operating results may fluctuate significantly as a result of a variety of factors, many of which are outside its control. After that, it says that it may need to secure additional funding and may be unable to raise additional capital on favorable terms, if at all. And just in December of 2021, the company issued about $240 million of senior notes in order to secure funding for its growth. After that, the company states that its biopolymer products may not achieve market success. Within this risk factor, the company lists out various factors associated with the market acceptance of its products. Next, the company says that it produces bio-based products from renewable sources whose pricing and availability may be impacted by factors outside its control. If its products and product candidates do not gain market acceptance among key market participants, it may be unable to generate significant revenues, if any. The company has limited experience in producing PHA in large commercial quantities. Some of its PHA products may never become commercially marketable, and it may be unable to obtain certifications required to retain customers. In this risk factor, the company states that the biodegradation certification is important to its customers, and the new PHA-based resin sold out of its Kentucky facility may not be able to get this required certification in a timely manner, which could delay the results of it not achieving its financial forecast and not fulfilling customer demand. Now we see that the company talks a lot about its PHA products. So let's go back to page six of this report to get a better idea of what PHA is. Over here, the company describes how PHA is produced, which is through a fermentation process where bacteria consume vegetable oil and produce PHA as energy reserves. PHA is a naturally occurring bioplastic that effectively biodegrades in both anaerobic environments such as waste treatment facility and aerobic environments such as industrial compost, home compost, soil, fresh water, and marine water. The second product that the company talks about is its PLA-based resin. PLA is made from dextrose sugar that is derived from corn, sugar beets, and sugar cane, among others. Now let's go back to page 9 to talk about the company's risk factors. The company may be unable to manage rapid growth effectively. It may be delayed in or unable to procure necessary capital. Its success will be influenced by the price of petroleum relative to the price of bio-based feedstocks. 
In this risk factor, the company discusses how as the price of bio-based feedstock increases and or the price of petroleum decreases, its bio-based products may be less competitive relative to petroleum-based polymers. Next, the company talks about how certain contracts granting exclusivity rights to customers may limit its ability to sell products in certain markets. However, it states that these exclusivity agreements will expire between 2021 and 2026. The loss of one or more of its significant customers, a significant reduction in its orders, their inability to perform under these contracts, or a significant deterioration in its financial conditions could have a material adverse effect on its business, results of operations, and financial conditions. It may rely heavily on future collaborative partners. It faces and will face substantial competition. It may not be able to complete the proposed production capacity buildout at its Kentucky facility. Over the next few pages, the company outlines many more risk factors associated with investing in the company. However, let's focus on the risks associated by investing in the common stock. The company states that an active trading market for its common stock may not be available on a consistent basis to provide stockholders with adequate liquidity. Its stock price may be extremely volatile, and its stockholders may lose a significant part of their investment. Over here, the company outlines that its executive officers and directors as a group own approximately 23.5% of its outstanding common stock. Next, the company does not expect to declare any dividends in the foreseeable future. There can be no assurance that the company will comply with the continued listing standards of the New York Stock Exchange. It may be required to take write-downs or write-offs, which could cause a loss of some or all of your investments. If the company is unable to meet the expectations of investors or analysts, the market price of its securities may decline. Next, the company will incur significant increased expenses and administrative burdens as a public company. Its failure to timely and effectively implement controls and procedures required by Sarbanes-Oxley could have a materially adverse effect on its business. Next, the company talks about how it is an emerging growth company. And as an emerging growth company, it is exempt from making certain disclosures, which could make the investment less attractive. Next, the management has limited experience in operating public company. The loss of certain key personnel could negatively impact the operations and financial results of its business. It may issue additional shares of common or preferred stock under an employee incentive plan, which could dilute the interest of its stockholders. Next, the company talks about how because it does not have current plans to pay cash dividends on common stock for the foreseeable future, the investor may not receive any return on investment unless the investor sells common stock for a price greater than what the investor paid for it. In other words, the only way to make money in this investment is the price of the stock appreciates. The last risk factor is that if securities or industry analysts do not publish or cease publishing research or reports about us, the price and trading volume of our securities could decline. Now that we have a brief understanding of the risks associated with investing in this company, let's go to page 22 where the company outlines the consolidated results of operations for the fiscal year 2019 and 2020. The first line item is the revenue, which is the top line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that the company brings in via sales. We can see that the revenue saw a 46.3% growth from 2019 to 2020. Next is the gross profit. The gross profit is revenue minus the cost of revenue. Back in 2019, the company's gross profit was about $11.1 million. And for the year 2020, it was about $11.5 million. In other words, the company's gross profit grew by about 3.2%. Next, looking at the operating expense, back in 2019, the company's operating expense was about $21.5 million, and for the year 2020, it grew to about $27.2 million. In other words, the company's operating expense grew by about 26%. Finally, looking at the net income, in this case, net loss, back in 2019, the company reported a net loss of about $19.5 million, and for the year 2020, it reported a loss of about $8.8 .8 million. Reasons why the company reported a lower loss number in 2020 as compared to that of 2019 is because for the year 2020, the company had a lower loss from operations. Second, the company had a gain on its private warrants because of the decline in the company's stock price. And finally, the company had a lower interest expense. After that, the company talks about the numbers associated with each line item. For the revenue, the company saw a 51% increase in product revenue, which was a 35% increase in pounds sold and an approximately 13% increase in its weighted average selling price. In other words, the company's higher sales number were driven by the fact that it sold more at a higher price. Next, the company talks about its cost of revenue and gross profit, where it states that the increase in the cost of revenue is primarily a result of 35% increase in the pounds of products sold and shipping during the period. Cost of revenue also included a 1.2 million increase in depreciation expense and a 1 million increase in rent expense. Finally, looking at the operating expense, the company states that the increase in its SGN expense was primarily due to an increase in compensation expense of $4.6 million, 
primarily related to a $3.8 million bonus payable to the CEO upon the completion of the business combination. Said differently, the CEO got a $3.8 million bonus once the business combined with the SPAC. Now let's go to page 29 of this report where we get a better idea of how the CEO is actually getting its bonus. The one thing I do not like about this is the CEO's bonus is tied to the EBITDA. EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization and rent, stock-based compensation, and certain non-recurring charges and operating leases. The thing that I don't like about this incentive structure is that it disregards some of the expenses that are needed in order to keep the business running. For example, you cannot get away with not paying interest or taxes or rent on your property. Now let's go to page 33 of this report. On here, the company's boards and named executive officers are listed and the ownership that those officers have within the company. We can see that the CEO owns about 5.8% of all the common stock outstanding. And overall, holistically, all the directors and executive officers, which are in total are 12 of them, own about 23.5% of all the stock outstanding. So in a way, we can think that the company's board of directors and management has skin in the game. Now let's go to page five of this report where we get an understanding of the market opportunity that the company has. Danimer believes that PHA is a competitive replacement for polypropylene, polyethylene, polystyrene, and PET plastics. These plastics represent over 63% of traditional petrochemical-based plastic worldwide, so there is a potential for PHAs to replace over 500 billion pounds of plastic applications annually. Next, the company talks about how its products are a better alternative to the traditional plastics when it comes to the environment, public health, renewability, and certification. Finally, looking at the business strategy, the company's goal is to build a commercially successful biopolymers business with attractive margins based on unique properties of its PHA and PLA biopolymers. To achieve this goal, the company is developing and commercializing biopolymers in a range of applications. The key elements of its strategy include the expansion of its Kentucky facility, which is well suited for the commercial production of PHAs. Next, the company talks about its greenfield facilities, where it has begun exploring construction of new fermentation plants in order to further expand its production capability of PHA. Next is the research and development. The company is seeking to expand the number of PHA research and development contracts it has with global consumer product companies. R&D contracts provide revenue, and the company expects a successful R&D processes to culminate in supply agreements with the customers. Finally, the company talks about strategic partnerships and that it is exploring strategic partnerships and licensing opportunities. Before we move on to the valuation part, let's quickly glance over the customers and product applications for the PHA products. These are the companies that the company has agreements with. Some of the big names include PepsiCo, where Danimer would be helping in the development of the biodegradable film raisins, which would be used in the Frito-Lay chips bags. The other big name is Nestle, where the company is helping in the development of biodegradable water bottles. Now let's try to figure out why David Einhorn decided to invest in this company. Over here, I pasted the company's current stock price, which is about $7.55 per share. The company's current market cap is about $757.6 million. The company has total debt of about $29.54 million as of September 2021. The company's cash and cash equivalents are about $194.23 million. I got these numbers from the company's most recent 10Q, which was published in September of 2021. When we add the company's market cap to its total debt and subtract the cash and cash equivalents, we get the company's enterprise value to be about $592.91 million. The enterprise value can be thought of as the company's total value. So if you had to purchase the whole company today, what kind of money would you have to pay out in order to purchase that company? A recent development was that on December 21st, 2020, the company decided to issue some senior notes, which equated to about $240 million. And when we add these notes that are due in 2026 to the company's enterprise value of $592.91 million, we get the company's new enterprise value to be about $832.91 million. Next, we do some research on the global plastic bottles and container market. This research showed that the expected value of the global plastic and bottles market is expected to reach about $225 billion by 2025. And this other research showed that it's expected to get to about $240 billion by 2025. So we can be conservative and expect the market to grow to about $225 billion by 2025. If Danimer is able to get even 1% market penetration in this market, then it would equate to about $2.25 billion. If you were to compare this $2.25 billion to the $833 million of enterprise value, we can see that it would be about a 2.7 bagger if you were to invest in this company. 
In the annual report, the company did say that its PHA-based resin is able to replace about 63% of all the traditional plastic. If we are overly optimistic and think that Ganymer would be able to replace 63% of all the traditional plastic, then what we get is make this 0.63. It would be 170 bagger if you were to invest in this stock. So if you're conservative and realistic, it would be about a 2.7 bagger. But if you are overly optimistic, then it could be 170 bagger. And despite all the risks that we went over, this is what I think David Einhorn saw when it came to investing in this company. Hey guys, that is all I had for you this week. Hopefully you found this video on Danimer interesting. If you like this content, please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions on which stock I should review next, please leave it in the comment section below. I'll greatly appreciate it. Thank you.